In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. <coughs> I think if we listen and understand what I'm going to say this evening, I'm sure you will have tons of questions at the end. So please, if you like to take notes now while I'm speaking about questions, because I'm sure all questions will be very important questions. And we might not be able to cover everything, but at least we can select some of those significant questions and answer them at the end. You know, when we say healthy relationships in a family, this is a family meeting, this is about parents. About parenting, about marriage, about relationships, about family dynamics, about interactions inside the family. And we need to understand how such relationships may be very constructive or sometimes very destructive. That's why, and this would explain to us why something like separation happens, divorce, abandonment, etc., etc. Let me start first with a verse, because I love this verse, one in the last chapter in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16, and it's about the church at home. The churches of Asia greet you. Achilla and Priscilla or Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Just for a couple seconds, focus on these last few words. The church that is in their house. Because I believe personally that that's exactly what we miss today in our families. We are families without churches. And this will end up with churches without families. Unless we care to have churches in our families, in our homes, our churches will lose families. For the devil, of course. First, I'd like just to explain a few words about the human brain. The human brain, the mind. How does it work? And this is very important. We all have brains. And this is probably the three elements of the mind. We feel, we remember, and we think. And the outcome of those three elements we make our decisions. Any decision should go through these three centers. And I'll show you the human brain, like a picture of the human brain. Back and deep here, inside the brain, there is a center called, called the amygdala. Don't worry about the names but call it the center of emotions, feelings. That's the center. We all were born with that center at one point. Not at one point, at the time when we were born. The first thing that a baby, a newly born baby, would do is to feel, to have some emotions. What does that baby do? First thing, not cry, <laughs> scream, scream, ah, scream. What is this scream about? It's about a feeling. 
I am so worried about my presence in the world. What's going on with me? Am I safe? Am I secure or not? And that's the basic feeling we all carry from birth until death. We live with fear, deep feeling of fear. And if you are sensitive to what you say every day, just please count how many times you say, I am afraid, I am scared, I am worried. This feeling is within us all because we we'll worry about losing something in life or losing life itself. So that's the center of, fe of, of emotions, the amygdala, feelings. Connected to that center, there is another center called memory. We call it hippocampus. Hippocampus. That's the storage of all experiences that we pass by. Those experiences sometimes are good. Some of those experiences are bad, negative. And they are all stored in that hippocampus. And then, here in the front, there is something, some parts in the front called the prefrontal cortex, the outer layer of the brain behind the forehead here. That's the center of rational thinking, wisdom, insight, good decisions making depth, farsightedness, etc. However, this center is very, very undeveloped in the babies and children. It grows slowly. That's why children cannot make their own decisions and be right all the time. Someone has to take care of children. When does this become mature? Maybe by age 24, 25, 26. Not 18. Later. Those three centers are so connected to each other. They call them the limbic system. And you know the limb, limb, what's a limb? Limb is like upper limb, like the, like here, or lower limb. But the limb is mainly three parts. Here, upper limb, I have the shoulder joint, and then the elbow joint, and then the wrist joint. But they are all connected. And they all work together in harmony to move my arm or forearm or hand. That's how my hand and my forearm and my arm are, we call them functional. They can do functions. That's why we need to understand how this brain works and how we make it work better or best. For example, someone who is having, let us go to, very negative feelings, for example. Like sad, like mad, like angry, like scared, like depressed. Etc., etc. And then you 
ask that person to do something like giving them a good advice advices unfortunately don't go to the feelings directly they go to the prefrontal cortex here to the center of thinking of rational thinking so when you when I come to you and say my dear friend I am sad and you tell me go and and just uh, sit down with yourself and maybe say a prayer but I am sad no you need to go and say a prayer I went and said a prayer and it doesn't work with me I'm still sad You won't, you won't say to that person, to me, oh, you are useless. You don't know God because you don't pray. No, I pray, but I'm still sad. Who is right and who is wrong here? Of course I will be right. You know why? Because you are speaking a different language to me that I don't understand. You are talking to my rational thinking when my rational thinking doesn't work. But if you come and tell me, I know you are sad and I feel for you. And I love you so much. Come and give me a hug. I understand how sad you are. Let us go and pray together. Yeah. This would work. You know why? Because you spoke a language that I understand. My feeling is taking the upper hand in my mind, not my thinking. I'm giving that to you like an example of why in a family we live under the same roof, under the same ceiling, but we don't understand each other. I don't understand anybody. No one can understand me. No one can feel what I feel. Let us go. Aspects of relationships. What defines a relationship? Kinds of relationships. Casual short-term relationships. Long-term relationships. Family immediate and extended. Then we talk about family dynamics and family systems and then communication. What defines a relationship? What is a relationship? Hmm? Anybody wants to suggest anything? What is a relationship? A relationship is something that connects me with somebody else. This is a relationship. And this relationship can be casual, like uh, on my way flying here this uh, afternoon, somebody was sitting beside me and we started to talk. But what about the talk? What kind of talk that can relate me to that person who is sitting me only for an hour or a couple of hours? It will be only uh, maybe politics, maybe sports. Hmm? Maybe, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 stock market, anything like that. President Trump, <laughs> anything like that. But I mean, after a couple hours, goodbye, good luck. Never see them again. It's casual. 
short term relationship. But in a family, family, when I live with my significant other, my spouse, and my children live with me for years and years and years. And I have a job to do to make everybody in my family as happy as possible. Take care of my spouse, my wife, take care of my husband and raise my children the right way. Right? So, this is a long-term relationship. And this, in such relationships, there will be many challenges. We'll see examples of those challenges. And there is also extended family. It's not only my spouse and my children. What about my brother, my cousin, my uncle, my aunt, my sister, my, uh, 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 I mean, uh, second cousin, extended family. But here, something say there are priorities. Who comes first after we get married? Who comes first? My parents, my children, or my spouse? Or my extended family? My spouse, number one. And who is next? My children. Then my parents, then everybody else. So, that's how we define the relationships inside the family, we say, we call them family dynamics, and they put it under a theory, of course, uh, Dr. Mary talked about that before to you, what we call the family systems theory. Family system theory. They say that a family is like a system. And inside that system, there are attachments, dynamics, bondings, etc., etc. And that's all also related to the major challenge inside the family. How do we communicate? How do we communicate? So, that in, the, in the family system theory, they say, there are bonding, there is attachment, there is positive and negative bonding called the axes. In a family, typical family, there are a functional family system. What is the functional family system is like? Hmm? It's about an upper axis that connects or bonds the parents together, two spouses, father and mother, husband and wife, are so tightly connected. You know why? Because when they got married, God said, let them be one flesh. Jesus said in Matthew 19, they are no more two, but one flesh. So this bond should be very strong connecting the parent to the parent. At a lower axis there are child to child, brother to brother, sister to sister, brother to sister, sister to brother. Inside this axis that connects the two parents, parents have something called Locked master bedroom. They have the, their own private life. They have their confidential stuff between each other. No one should know 
part of their lives for what is going on inside that master bedroom. I'm not saying about the sexual aspect, but the very, very special and private things like their project, their future uh, plans, etc., like that, their, uh, their uh, budgets or, or uh, uh, finances, things like that. Not only they keep it secret from the children, but they also should keep it secret from even their parents. Okay? The children, on the other hand, they have also their own secrets. Your son may come to his brother and say, oh, you know, I fell in love with that girl. Or the sister would call, come to her brother or her other sister, I have a crush on that boy. These are normal things among children. I have no business in knowing all that. As long as my children are functional, spiritually, academically, socially, etc., etc. They are healthy. In a dysfunctional family system, on the other hand, the attachments are different because a parent may get attached to a child and a child would get attached to the parent. How does this happen? By the way, this is very common. Dysfunctional family, this is exactly how families break down, fail, because of this thing. A parent would start to get attached to a child, and then the child will get attached to the parent. Let me get into the details here. What's healthy, functional and dysfunctional families expectations, objectives, and tasks, and the five basic needs in marriage. Number three is the most important here. We talked about function and dysfunctional. You know what's the difference between function and dysfunctional? Hmm? How do you measure a functional family or a dysfunctional family? I think we all know that. Like, uh, that lady who called me in between the two flights today from one of the states far away from here, very far. I got your number from uh, a priest and I'm calling because I'm very depressed. My husband is mad at me. We have been married for 22 years. We have uh, three grown children doing well, more or less. But me and my wife, our life is like hell. And she started to give the details. What was wrong? What went wrong in that relationship? There was some element here. Element of dysfunctionality. Expectations, objectives, and tasks. When we get married, when you get married, when I got married, I had expectations. I expected something from my spouse. I expected something that I will get from my marriage. That's why I got married. If it doesn't make a difference, why should I bother and get married? Let me stay single. Why should I carry that burden of a family? Objectives. Our objectives are to fulfill the expectations and the needs. And this is my task. Five basic needs in marriage. Let me go back with 
my memory. Can we go back with, can you go back with your memory? Try to squeeze your memory. <coughs> to remember how was your father and mother doing in their own marriage. This is important, by the way. You know why? Because by nature, we tend to repeat, repeat the same exact themes that we learned or witnessed in our childhood. Something in Arabic, they say, الولد طالع لأبوه والبنت تقلب القدرة على فمها تطلع البنت لأمها My own parents marriage there was five main areas of spousal interaction love and affection intimacy and sexuality communication Mutual validation and respect. And meeting the needs. In any marriage, could this impact me as a child? What does happen when one parent or the other is not available or is not giving the other his or her dues of love and affection? Sexual needs, intimacy, healthy communication, mutual validation and respect, and all other needs. What about love and affection? We'll see that. Love. What's love? What's love? If you go back with your memory, when you're still dating your future spouse, how frequent you mention the word love. After you got married, how frequent do you say the word love to each other? You think there is love? You know why? Because love is actually the dynamic force that will bond you together. This is love. God is love. And when you say God is love, what is about love and God? Because God's love is the bonding force, energy, that would, would connect me with the other, especially my most significant other. My most significant other. But love is easy to say when it comes to practicing love this is challenging because love means also sacrifice My, means that I give more than I expect to receive this is love and then number two intimacy and sexuality I'm still surprised that many, many, many in our culture until today they reject even to mention the word S-E-X when it comes to sex it's like the devil who created sex? Who designed marriage to be about sex and sexual intimacy? If I don't learn how to become sexually functional in my life, 
with all its meaning functional according to God's plan not according to the world's plan God was never was never wrong when he created sex and our sexual organs the, the beautiful God the creator the creator who created our sexual instincts and drives and our sexual organs created them for a purpose to bring us together into intimacy in marriage in a very holy unblemished undefiled relationship but still I go somewhere and, and see that sex is anathema. You can't speak about sex. You can't teach. You can't, you can't even teach your children how to protect themselves, how to help themselves beware of the tricks of the devil today. I'm glad that you have a wonderful committee here with a wonderful leader and his wife taking care of that. God bless them. I speak all the time about what you do here, Dr. Sam and Dr. Mary, and the committee that you formed here. And we are waiting to see that. I, I just told the, all the bishops that I meet with, and I do that all the time, and they welcome seeing that sex education because that's how we may end up in trouble as we see healthy communication mutual validation respect and meeting all other needs if i was raised in a family where one parent has been our alcoholic spouse married to his job or her job or a distracted spouse confusing priorities or an emotionally dry spouse someone who doesn't know how to express feelings to his or her spouse little or no feelings shown or an abusive spouse violated boundaries or an addicted spouse obsessed with their own addiction. What will happen when one parent or one spouse or the other has been like that? What will happen to the other spouse? That's exactly what we'll discuss now. Three major outcomes happen in, inside the family. Dysfunctional marriage. A dysfunctional family life. And a condition called codependence. Anybody heard about the word codependence before? I don't know its translation in Arabic, actually. Codependence. This in codependence, mutual dependence and love shift to another area or activity to meet the deprived or the suffering family members' emotional and physical needs. Okay, for example, I expect from my spouse sexual fulfillment. But my spouse is not giving me the fulfillment and the gratification I need. So what would happen here? I have been dependent on my spouse. I loved my spouse. But my spouse 
is not capable or never received this good sex education or uh, consider sex is something bad and negative I, I had cases, many cases like that two extremes when the spouse is either a sex addict and he's asking the other spouse to, to be a sex slave evil bad and the other case when the spouse would come to the other spouse and say no 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 sex is bad not this way you know how 55 days we have the great land you are not going to touch me and the other poor spouse would say but I need I have sexual needs how can I deal with that but the religious spouse say not in the land not in the holy week not in this tomorrow is Friday we go to church we have fasting and then after that Saturday we'll have another liturgy on Sunday this is Sunday the holy day and Monday I'm tired I'm fatigued and, and so on so this spouse poor spouse will develop the codependence shifting to other area or activity like what like what very common today the spouse that needs for example affection may go out and look for some relationship or cheating or just fulfill sexual needs through the pornography stuff or that stuff or anything and that's because of this codependence because my spouse is not giving me what I need this I'm going just giving you just one example but there are tens of thousands probably of examples like that but in codependence, there are unhealthy attachments, violated boundaries, and then what we call emotional incest. What is incest? Incest, the word incest or physical incest here means Sexual, sexual relationships among the members of the same family. Like between a father and his daughter, between a mother and her son, between a brother and sister, between uncle and niece, between aunt and nephew, between a girl and her husband and her cousin, or a boy and his cousin. It's called physical incest. But I'm talking more frequently about emotional incest. Emotional incest means I take my emotions and invest in someone else and fall in love with that person. Like, for example, have you ever heard about a mother who feels ignored and neglected abandoned by her husband and then she starts to develop very strong attachment with her son or a father the same thing with his daughter just the emotional attachment and then that son 
at age eight and nine, mommy would come to me, I am the son, say, Habibi, your father is not Sa'il Faya, but it's Al Shifaya. He doesn't talk to me. He doesn't give me attention. He doesn't, he doesn't ignores me. He doesn't even sleep with me. Oh. <laughs> that happens. He doesn't give me money. He doesn't, he wants to control me. And then, if I were the girl and my dad would come to see me, Habibti, my beloved daughter, I love you. You are better than your mother. Because your mother is not for me. She's so busy. That's how it starts. How would I perceive that as a son or as a daughter? What do you think? I will start to believe that. Mommy, is that what daddy doing to you all the time? Ignoring you, neglecting you? I am better than my dad. I will take care of you. I will marry you, mom. Believe it, they say it sometimes. And then, Listen to the rest of the story. I'm now 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, but at one point, I will become 30. And mommy would come to say, Habibi, you need to get married now. You are old now. I want to be happy with you and happy for you. Okay, mommy. Okay, next year. And maybe next year never comes. You know why? Because every time I start to think of getting married to a nice, beautiful girl, my inside my heart, my mind, there is a voice saying, how come you are going to get married and cheat on your mother? Neglect your mother. Ignore your mother. And that's one reason, just only one reason, for example, why today many young men don't get married until late, maybe never. All what they do just today, fulfill their sexual needs through pornography, through relationships, cyber sex, whatever. But one day, I decide to get married. And then my mother will come say, congratulations, you got married. But you think that uh, she is good like me? Does she know how to do molokheya like me? Does she know how to do the laundry like me? I miss you. You never called me yesterday. You know that? You used to call me five times a day before. Now you... Well, how would a son like that feel? Of course carrying a heavy burden of guilt. And now you understand how codependence play the game in our lives. Many ways. Misattachments, wrong attachments, negative attachments and bondings. I had cases, unfortunately, very sad. Like a wife living with a husband, a very good husband, 
very beautiful, very polite, very, very, very generous. He loves his wife. After 20 years of living together, the wife may come and seek divorce and separation. And she tells a very sad story. Since day one, her husband was sexually dysfunctional. Either with something called premature ejaculation or impotence, erectile dysfunction. And then I sit, I sit with the husband and I discover that priorities, mommy. Mommy is preoccupying his mind day and night. The wife would say, uh, if I, uh, I used to when forget any password, that my husband installed. She said, let me try his mother's name. And it works. Why? Because of those misattachments inside the mind between this young son and his mom. And poor mom. That mom lost her husband because of something. So she has decided to get married to her son. And now his son, her son is a miserable husband and his wife is going to leave him, for example. How? Why? That's why we need to learn we need to teach ourselves about basics of education, mental health, communication, sex education, all that stuff. So, so important. Boundaries, violating spiritual boundaries. Boundaries are natural natural lines that would make me stop of crossing that I cannot cross when I cross a boundary or the line that line or red line call it red line then something would happen in a family relationships it's very important to understand boundaries and spiritual boundaries, physical boundaries, and emotional boundaries. Spiritual boundaries are about me. When I separate myself from God, when I disobey God, when I separate myself from myself, this I call it spiritual boundaries. And this last one in black, separation from self, is very important. You know why? Because it's about something called lack of self-awareness. When I'm not aware of what's going on with me, once I lose that touch with myself, I hurt myself or I hurt somebody else. It's very important to be aware of your feelings and of what's going on with yourself all the time. That's how you keep connected to God, obeying to God, and keep connected, connected to each other. Loss of self-awareness. Violating our physical 
boundaries. The body. The body is a gift from God. And we shall be account, we'll give account to God for our, how we use our bodies. It's very important. In a family, we need to look at the body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We can violate our physical boundaries when we neglect each other, neglect our children, neglect our physical needs, or abuse them. Extremes of neglect can hurt you eventually, hurt your body. You need to be aware of what you eat, how many hours you sleep, whether you exercise or not, you take your essential vitamins and, and minerals, balance your food, spend time in meditation, this will keep you healthy, keep your memory strong. Never neglect, never abuse your body. Fortunately, we don't know sometimes we, how we abuse ourselves. Overburden ourselves. But abuse also can be fearful. The body is not evil. Neglecting our body weakens our spiritual resistance against evil. This is, may sound a little bit weird because sometimes we learn that if you focus too much on your body yeah. means that you neglect your spirit. Actually, yeah. it's not like that. Focusing and taking care of your body doesn't mean that you spoil your body. Eat too much, sleep too much, rest too much, <coughs> laziness. But when you take care of your body, your mind will be stronger and you can be more capable of fighting the devil. Accepting yourself means accepting your body and caring for it. These are very essential basics in relationships inside the family because these are the healthy attitudes we teach our children too and these are the healthy attitudes that we set for ourselves as role models it says here no one hated his body at all but nourishes it and nurtures to it before i move to communication I would rather also emphasize one thing. Physical abuse of anybody at home is a major crime by assaulting, by physical hurting, or even emotional hurting, by hitting, by slapping, all that stuff is not acceptable in a family setting. Unfortunately, I still hear stories about people who came from Egypt recently and they still take it for granted a husband has the right to hit his wife, hit his wife and hit his children. We need to raise against such behaviors. Communication. Why communication is important? Because without communication, we don't understand each other. 
Like that example I mentioned early. When I said, I am sad, and you say, go and pray. It means to me that you don't understand me. Communication is about connect, connect, connection to each other, connectivity to each other. And I spoke years ago about that in details, and I'm sure Dr. Sami speaks about that all the time. But it's very important in a family relationship. And I remind you that communication about, is about communicating feelings, not facts. When you communicate facts and the other person is still working or uh, relying on his or her amygdala, that part in the brain where the affect and the emotions are centered, then you lost, con con you lost communication with that person. Spotting feelings versus advice giving. What's wrong with giving advices in family relationships? We love to give advices. I had some, uh, someone a couple of days ago, she's a lady and she said, my father of confession doesn't listen. Once I sat down with him, he keeps talking, preaching me, and giving advice to me all the time. And I said to her, I said, how do you feel about that? And she thought, but she was a little shy of saying something bad about her father of confession. But I had the guts to spot the feeling and said, do you feel like frustrated? She said, yes, all the time. I feel like he doesn't listen, he doesn't hear me. So this is a trap, a trap that even fathers of confession may fall into. But in a family, it is unforgivable. Just to not to listen to feelings or not to listen, period. You and we all need to learn how to focus on feelings and spot feelings and address feelings all the time. Also, nonverbal communication is very important. You don't have to communicate through words, verbally. Just remember that we can communicate through body language. And you spot the feeling. Negative communication means a lot here. Interruption, passive aggressiveness, passive resistance, stonewalling, boycotting, etc. Non-acceptable. You shall never communicate in a negative way. Boundaries again. Our emotional boundaries, how do we get hurt emotionally? When we do not feel loved, listen to this, this is important. Number two, when we feel neglected. Number three, when we are exposed to abuse. Number four, when we are not respected. Number five, when we are not listened to. Number six, when we are unable to express ourselves. And last one, when we are not affirmed or validated or encourage it. 
This all about emotional abuse, lack of emotional boundaries. And this can hurt any kind of family relationship on earth. If you look into this chart, not feeling loved. Never please ignore your child when your child would come and say, you don't love me, or you love my brother or sister more than me. Or when disrespect each other. We need to learn how to respect the feelings even of our children, not only of adults, parents, spouses. Listen to your children, listen to each other. They found out that any, any exposure to abuse away from home can be treated immediately by letting the abused child speak up and talk about his or her abuse to someone, especially parents. In other words, your child may come from school, but this happens all the time, and would complain about some bullying that happened your child at school. This happens all the time. If the child is not listened to or didn't have the chance for unity to come home and talk to you as a parent and you listen to your child's story and affirm or validate your child's feelings and you say to your child Habibi, Habibti, I love you so much you sound like you were so hurt and the child may keep talking listen or start to cry just to give them hugs because that's how bullying will lose its impact on your child why so many hundred teenagers in, in north america commit suicide every year because of bullying because this of this specific thing. Our children are not listened to. They are worried about coming to you because they know if they come and tell you, you don't listen, or you will be mad at them. Or you will point finger and say, you did that first. You let that to happen, to blame your child. This is very, 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 and extremely serious and very damaging to a child. But unable to express ourselves and not affirm validity. Now, there is some significant issues. Attitudes and habits inside the family. I would love to see that our attitudes in the family are becoming positive attitudes. For example, you shall not fail anybody in your family by saying, no use, no hope in you. Very bad. You shall never fail anybody by saying that. Actually, the opposite is good. Don't worry, Habib. It's not the end of the world. What's the big deal? You couldn't make it that time. You'll make it next time. You got a deal. You will... You'll take a C and B next time. You got a B, you get an A. Don't worry. Even if you get an F, don't worry. You're good. I know you're good. You'll make it next time. 
positive attitudes, patterns, create patterns and behaviors, lead, be a leader in your family. Don't ask your family or your children to do something that you don't do. A few days ago, I had a 15 years old girl brought to me by her mother. And this girl had a problem with vaping recently. She has been vaping. And every time she promises her mom, her mom would discover that she went back to vaping. You know vaping? Familiar with that? Okay. And you know what she said to me? After uh, six months of talking, trying just to figure out the trauma in her life, and she said the trauma, my father has been a smoker, heavy smoker, since he was 17. He's now above 50. I'm so much worried about him. He will die young. And that kind of thought or fear is adding too much stress to her. So when she is so stressed out, how can she manage her stress? Of course, she will see the behavior of her father like a role model. What's wrong? She never, never say that. If my father has been smoking for that long, why, what's wrong that I smoke once in a while? Attitudes, habits, patterns, <coughs> behaviors. Listen to that feeling of anger. Anger is natural. There is nothing wrong with somebody at home, with your family, who is angry. Because unless I expose my anger, express it, and should express it the right way, I will keep my anger inside a locked room here in the back mind, and this will act up in my mind later on. Will make me crazy, will lead me into something bad. What about somebody who is so explosive? Unpredictable anger, because that person has kept anger for a long time. And if we don't express our anger appropriately, it will lead into depression. Stubbornness, rigidity, rebellion, they are all manifestations of something wrong. Some negative dynamics in the family. Unexpressed feelings. We need to address that. The IDC. You know what is the IDC? Hmm? Kids, young kids, our children. The, one of the very frequent words they say or write when they chat or, or text, IDC, which means I don't care. I don't care. I hope no one of us adults would say I don't care because when I say IDC, it means that I have a problem. How come I can be so indifferent about what's going on? So cold. I need to care. And probably when they, our children say IDC, it means that they see something going on at home between dad and mom. I don't care. Yeah. If we don't care, if we say we don't care, then don't blame your child 
if they don't care in the future. Acting out, our children sometimes are very naughty, acting out, chuei, hyper. Doesn't mean that all hyper children are having attention deficit disorder, no. Many of those <laughs> AD, uh, ADD or whatever is about suppressed feelings that our children express through hyperactivity. Okay. طفل الشيء ده لو بتشاوله ممكن يبقى في مشاكل في البيت عشان كده بيطلعها في الشقاوي Be sensitive to your children's feelings There are so many children in our families when they reach that age of 11, 12, 13, 14, especially with girls, they start something called self-mutilation, cutting. Have you ever heard about cutting? Very sharp razor, and they cut their skin. And I see the scars sometimes as thick as maybe two inches in girls like 16 and 18 i saw that very sad when they start self-mutilation this means that either or they have suppressed feelings and those feelings were never validated children who live in families that parents don't validate that child's feelings they tended to cut themselves Or children with depression. You know why? Because cutting releases the good substance in their brains called endorphins. Dopamine and serotonin. And give them a good feeling. I remember that girl, she mentioned that. And uh, she was like 14. And she told me. When I cut myself, I feel good. And I know that dopamine is being released in my brain. But this means that this child is troubled or living in a troubled family. And then there's danger of addiction. And we don't have time to cover that today. But addiction is creeping very slowly but surely to take lives. Every now and then we hear about one of our young people who died from overdose. Addiction in the United States kills one person every 58 seconds. 58, less than a minute. And nowadays, addiction is not about only drugs and alcohol. It's something that ruins the minds and the future, the marriages. Addiction to the internet, what we call internet compulsive disorder. And then the last thing is about education. Education. What do you do to educate your children or introduce them to health education? We talked about sex education and it's so important. Sex education, is that important? Can you believe it now? That 25% of our children in North America carry a smartphone that's open to everything. 
by H6. That the first exposure to pornography among children, heroin, 11,000 times more. Probably they are doing more research on that. So education, sex education, Christian education, we need to be aggressive. Because if we don't educate our children, they will definitely be educated, but unfortunately from the wrong sources. From the wrong sources. It's our job as parents, as church, to understand how to do the job. It's tough, it's challenging, we were not probably prepared for that because we were not educated in everything when we were children. But, you know, it's you have the enemy in front of you and you have the sea behind you. You have to fight. Thank you so much. Glory be to God now and forever. You want to take uh, maybe five minutes breaks and then we can have sure, some questions? Sure, sure, sure. You want to say a hymn? Look at the church and the Sunday school as being as it has to be in a traditional traditional way. We have to uh, we have to talk about things in Sunday school. In the church we have to talk about religious things. And they are not going to, to listen to anything about sexual uh, education or any challenges that uh, different which groups are, uh, are facing in the normal life. So my question is, how can we approach these ways of thinking uh, in a nice way to convey the message? that it is important to teach or to talk about sexual education, to talk about challenges, to talk about education, openly, and just not to hide faces and away from them. Very good question. Thank you. Your question points to a problem that we suffer from. I have been suffering from this problem for a long time which is called detachment from generation between generations called generational internet detachment yes and even we see that in the way we teach our children uh, we don't know exactly whether my child is learning anything, anything from what I say or not as a teacher. Because I am a little bit, let me describe myself as a teacher, as a mentally rigid person. My mind and my, my ways have been shaped up according to a specific uh, form. And I believe that if I don't follow that form, my children are not going to become religious or spiritual in the future. However, and this is the solution. The solution is proved, proved that children won't learn unless you teach them something relevant to them. Something that adheres and sticks to their minds through addressing or mo mobilizing their feelings. If you teach children, and that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ used to do in his teachings, he used to address needs 
and feelings of people. Unless we address those needs of children based on their daily life, their suffering, their issues, their problems, they won't learn anything. And that's why we have we live this pyramid in, in, in Sunday schools, in churches. Pyramids means when you go to a kindergarten and primary school students, you have so many people in your classes. Because all children are followers, have no control. They can make decisions, say, it's boring, I'm not going to go. But once they hit middle school and high school, the pyramid will, you'll see the, yes much less numbers. However, and I saw that in my life as a khadim, as a teacher. I mean, the, I remember one of my classes, one of the classes when I was taking care of the Sunday school in Cairo, Egypt, uh, our branch, uh, there was a class and the attendance in the class, and I'm talking about the late 1960s, early 1970s. 90% come every Sunday, 36 out of 40. And I was surprised why this related to other classes. And I found that the teacher was different. He used to do something very exciting, very applicable, and very relevant to the children. By the way, this teacher has become Motoran Metropolit Metropolitan of Balad uh, Fasaid uh, Smaheem, Samalud, Ambab of Notius. Why Iktimaat Abu Nazar Dawood Lamai? Why is he so attractive? Because of that, because of the, the he addresses address the needs of the people in a very relevant way, very exciting way. Everybody sits, they sit from 10 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock in the evening. Nobody says I'm tired or bored or anything. The same thing, of course. Sex education, of course. If you talk to their, your children, and I have, I mean, if you like to show you some example of lessons that we offer to kids at uh, five and six grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and you, I, I remember when I, I did that lesson in a church in, uh, in California, Riverside, years, maybe five years ago, we had like, 87, I remember 87, 88 boys and girls from grade four to grade seven. And the, their teachers said this is the first time ever that kids would be silent and quiet and that very focused and amazingly. And you know, when I came back to tell to, uh, to answer their questions, they said the same uh, way from 10.30 in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon, I answered about maybe something like 150 questions during that time. And they took only one break, one hour or 90 minutes to take lunch. But still, they sat silent, and the whole, whole talk was about sex education. No, no embarrassment, no nothing, because they they listen to you, and maybe they're surprised that Doctor Yusri, the some old man, gray hair, is can speak the language they understand, or they talk to each other. So, thank you. Yes. So Dr. Yusri, uh, the IDC or the I don't care stereotype is very common within grade 8 and 9 and nine. Very? Very common within yes. grade 9, 8, 9 and 9. Yes. And that's 
not only when it comes to problems within their own houses, it's kind of a, a life attitude for them. They don't care about yes. anything. Yes. Whenever you talk to them seriously, they don't take you serious. They don't don't care about what you're saying. Even Sunday school parents would relate. They don't care about what they're saying at home. It's, it's it's very, and I think it's one of the major things that we all can relate to. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, they might be saying, I don't care, but deep in their hearts, they're very broken, they're very hurt from maybe what's happening in their homes and what's going on. They might say, I don't care, but they really care, and, but, but they don't, they cannot say, or they don't know how to say it, or how to reflect it. How we can, as Sunday school teachers, overcome this barrier and try to approach them when they are even shutting us down, saying, I don't care, or not even saying it, they, they act as if they don't care. Excellent question. Very important to, to do that, to mobilize, to activate their feelings, to engage their feelings in something that will make them feel the empathy and the compassion. You know that the problem with IDC is what? That we are creating or ending up with some sick personalities, like narcissistic personalities. This is typical narcissism. Because narcissism means that I care about nobody but myself. And you say, you, you say it's right. I mean, it may come from the family. It's probably, it's probably they are expressing their anger, their frustrations, because nobody cares around them. But for me and you as Sunday school teachers, as church teachers, we need to give them some exercises with giving them like examples from life, real examples of life. Or sometimes to take them into uh, something applied, like take them into a homeless shelter and show them some, uh, I mean, examples of poor people let the the point here is i need to mobilize let them move their emotions move toward others take them into a hospital where people uh, somebody lost uh, a leg or a hand or sick something like that this proved to be good even at a young age i mean we we recommend nowadays because of out of experience that teenagers, for example, who are out of any any boundaries and out of order, very rebellious, send them to Egypt, send them to Sudan, send them to Brazil or to Bolivia. You know, let them go on a service trip with church. Proof they all come like saints. I had cases that treated early homosexual behaviors. Can you believe that? Homosexuality with young people aged 14 and 15. You know, it's very dangerous these days and we'll address that issue during the weekend. But I mean, I found out like when he sent that person on a service trip, it will take them from the focus on themselves to the focus on the others. So, briefly speaking, engage your students into something that will Engage, I mean, move them emotion, make them move emotion. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Uncle, as a parent, like, we all try our best 
to do the best with our children but at some times when we are stressed and with the work and everything we do all the mistakes probably that you mentioned so we shout we say i don't care we sometimes we don't listen how bad is the damage and how reversible it is like if let's say once a week i would get really mad and shout but then i would go back and apologize would that fix the damage definitely with children it fixes the damage very quickly once you correct the situation and do the right thing it helps a lot because children can easily uh, transform modify change respond okay especially when they see the sincere apology or regret from your side because they love us, they love you, they love daddy, and they don't want to see you hurt because, so this is a great thing. Actually, it's a way to fix even the old problems, the old mistakes that we committed when our children were young, and now they are in their 40s or 30s or so. Nothing will fix anything from the past like sincere apology without giving any excuses for our negative behaviors. Just, I made a mistake, I was wrong, forgive me, and please, I'm not going to move from here until I'm sure that you forgave me. You have forgiven me, that's how it's going. Yeah, very good. Other questions? Yeah.